Okay, let's try something together. Open any world map you have available. It can be the one you find in your bookcase or even an online version. Take a look at the vast area covered by water. That's 71% of the Earth's surface. And all that is salt water from the world's oceans. There aren't any borders between the four oceans we've all come to know. But oceanographers and the world's countries did traditionally split these waters into four distinct regions. The Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, and Arctic Oceans. And here comes the big surprise. The scientific community has recently recognized the fifth body of water. It's called the Southern Ocean, and three of the four original oceans border it. It circumnavigates Antarctica and the lower portion of the globe and reaches Australia and the southern portions of Africa and South America. What makes this ocean so special? How did the scientific community eventually recognize it? And more importantly, what mysterious creatures does it hide? (laughs) Let's find out! The Antarctic Ocean, or the Southern Ocean, was first mentioned back in 1937 in the second edition of the International Hydrographic Organization's Limits of Oceans and Seas. That's a mouthful. Back then, this organization considered that it was wrong to consider the Antarctic Ocean as its own distinct body of water. Why? Well, because at that time, an ocean was defined as water surrounded by land and not water surrounding land. However, they reconsidered it in 2000 and voted to include this ocean in the official list. They also decided on the name Southern Ocean over the commonly used Antarctic Ocean. Finally, the organization concluded that the ocean should be considered as ending at the 60th parallel south latitude. But how old is this ocean? Well, many specialists believe it to have formed only 30 million years ago, which would make it the youngest of the world's oceans. It was created when Antarctica and South America moved away from each other during the early stages of our planet's development. This unique water current is a distinctive component of the Southern Ocean, as it helps keep the waters flowing around the icy continent. It's called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and it moves to the east with incredible speed. It's estimated that it moves an enormous amount of water per second. Some of the disputes regarding the Southern Ocean also have to do with this amazing current. Some specialists believe it separates the water of the Southern Ocean from the waters of the nearing Atlantic or Pacific. Only the rapid circulating water is considered the Southern Ocean. On the other hand, though, a handful of scientists say that the current actually makes the naming issue more complex by not limiting the waters to a specific geographic location. They believe that the waters in the current are different in terms of composition from waters in the northern oceans because they are way colder and have a lot more salt. Sailors don't really like this new body of water, mostly because of the frequent cyclone-like storms that it experiences. They happen because of the big temperature difference between the ice packs and the ocean waves. As a result, these storms are very difficult to surpass for any sailors that happen to encounter them. I mean, really, these are the strongest winds found anywhere on our planet. More so, the vessels going through this area must also be wary of the frequent icebergs that may pop up every now and then, and also of the low surface temperatures. Just to paint you a better picture, some of the icebergs found here can span over several hundred meters and can exist all year round, regardless of the season. The latitudes from 50 to 70 have even earned the nicknames of Furious 50s or the Shrieking 60s because of these intense year-round storms. Even the landscape is unique. They say the Southern Ocean has bluer glaciers, colder air, and more intimidating mountains than anywhere else in the world. Now, let's get to the mysterious creatures that call this place home, as thousands of species of wildlife live only here and nowhere else in the world. Let's start with the quirky sea pig, or one of the sea cucumbers as it's sometimes called. There are a lot of them in the waters off Antarctica. Why is it called that way, though? Because of its pink hue and round, bloated looks. On a closer look, it even appears to have a little tail and set of ears, just like a pig. They do help a lot with the quality of the waters here, filtering sand and sediment. Then there are the hoff crabs that live on the floor of the Antarctic Sea. The Southern Ocean is a cold-water environment, but crabs are more adapted to warmer waters. 
So, hoff crabs gather around the warmth made by volcanic vents. They get the needed warmth and food here. You can find them in large piles, one on top of another, literally filling the space of the vent openings. Now, wonder how they got their unofficial name? Well, it's because of their apparent similarity to the actor David Hasselhoff, whose impressive chest reminded explorers of the crab. Okay. Ever seen a fish that's completely transparent? You'd have to get to these waters down in the south, but they do exist, and they are simply called the ice fish. You can basically see inside them, being completely clear and all. That's because of their see-through skin and because they don't have any red blood cells. Their special power is that they can use antifreeze to prevent their bodies from going solid in the cold waters of the Southern Ocean. Instead of the standard thicker blood, the red one with hemoglobin, ice fish have thinner blood that moves around more easily throughout their bodies, hence giving them the much-needed nutrients and oxygen. Now, is there a monster hidden in these waters? Some people believe this to be the case. And thanks to recent research, we even have video footage of it. Some Australian researchers stumbled upon a bunch of weird-looking creatures that were swimming near the seafloor of the Southern Ocean. This pink blob-like fish seemed to be propelled by a little pair of fins. To quote them on it, it seemed to resemble a chicken just before you put it in the oven. I'm not sure I even want to know what that looks like. It took them some time and research to identify the monster. It's a shy species of sea cucumber, known more by its uh, creative nickname, the headless chicken monster. We've known this creature has existed since the late 1800s, but we've barely ever seen it. And we've only ever captured it on tape once before when it was spotted in the Gulf of Mexico, which is quite far from the waters off the coast of East Antarctica. There's so much we don't know about this creature, like how many of them exist in our waters and how they live, eat, and reproduce. Ever heard of the emperor penguin? It's not a penguin species that just happens to have a crown on its head, if that's what you're thinking. But they are one of those penguins that inhabit this specific location and are also the largest species of their kind altogether. What makes them special is that they make their colonies on the sea ice, and most of them never step foot on land. More so, penguin dads lose almost half their weight while incubating the eggs. They're also fascinating swimmers, able to dive deeper and longer than any other bird, up to 700 feet. Not to mention they can stay submerged for up to 18 minutes at a time as they gather food. We have yet to uncover all the secrets of the mysterious Southern Ocean, but it's clear that it's home to some unique and fragile marine ecosystems. Recognizing it as a new ocean could be one way to focus the public attention on it and help its conservation. When you look at the seas and oceans on a map, you might think that they just flow into each other. Like, there's really only one big ocean, and people just arbitrarily gave different names to its different parts. Well, guess what? You'll be amazed at how much more substantial the borders between them actually are. For example, the border between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans is like a literal line between two different worlds. It looks like the two oceans meet at an invisible wall, which does not let them flow into each other and mix their waters. Why on earth does that happen? Obviously, there's no actual invisible wall inside, and water is just water. So what could be interfering with its next time? Well, the thing is that water isn't just water. There can be different kinds. The Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans have different densities and chemical makers, the level of salinity and other qualities. One can see by their color that they are far from the same. Borders like this, between two bodies of water with different physical and biological characteristics, are known as haloclines. Jacques-Yves Cousteau discovered one of them while he was deep diving in the Strait of Gibraltar. The layers of water with different solidity looked like they were divided with a transparent film, and each layer had its own distinct flora and fauna. Haloclines appear when water in one ocean or sea is at least five times saltier than in the other. You can create a halocline at home if you pour some seawater or colored salty water in a glass and then add some fresh water on top of it. The only difference is that your halocline will be horizontal and ocean haloclines are vertical.
For those of you who are paying attention in chemistry class, you might remember that if you have two liquids with different densities in one space, the denser liquid should eventually end up below the less dense one. By that logic, the border between the two oceans should look not like a vertical line, but a horizontal one. And the difference between their solidity would become less obvious the closer they got to each other. So why doesn't it work like that? Firstly, the difference in density of the two oceans is not big enough for one of them to sink down and the other one to rise up, but it is big enough to not let them mix. Another reason is inertia. There is an inertial force known as the Coriolis force, which influences objects when they are moving in a system of axes, which in turn are moving as well. In simpler terms, the Earth is moving, and all the moving objects on it are carried along, acted upon by this Coriolis force, deviating slightly from their natural course. As a result, the objects on the Earth's surface don't move straight on, but deviate in a curve, clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern. But because the Earth is moving slowly, after all, it does take the planet a whole day to make a full circle around its axis, the Coriolis effect isn't easy to observe in the short term. It becomes easier to notice only in long-term intervals, like with cyclones or ocean flows. And this is why the direction of flows in the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans is different. This difference also doesn't let them mix. Another important difference between these two ocean waters is the strength of molecule connection, or surface tensile strength. Thanks to this strength, molecules of the same kind hold on to each other. The two oceans have totally different surface tensile strengths, which also doesn't let them mix. Maybe if the waters were completely still, they could gradually start mixing over time. But as they flow in opposite directions, they just don't have time to do this. We think that it's just water in both oceans, but its separate molecules meet for just a very short moment and then get carried away with the ocean flow. But if you think that it's only the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans that don't get along with each other, you are sorely mistaken. There's lots of places on the planet where the waters of the two seas or rivers don't mix, and for even more weird reasons. For example, there's a different kind of border called a thermocline. These are borders between waters of different temperatures, like between the warm water of the Gulf Stream and the much colder North Atlantic Ocean. But the most interesting kinds are called chemoclines. These are borders between waters having different microclimate and chemical makeup. The Sargasso Sea is the biggest and most widely known chemocline. It is a sea within the Atlantic Ocean, which has no shores, but is very obviously distinct. You can't not notice it. Let's now take a look at some other spectacular clines we have on planet Earth. And just as a heads up, I might mispronounce some of these names coming up, so please forgive me. First up, we have the North and Baltic Seas. These two seas meet near the Danish city of Skagen, the water in them doesn't mix because of different densities. Sometimes you can see the waves of the two seas clash into each other, making foam. Their waters do mix very, very gradually. That's why the Baltic Sea is slightly saline. If there had been no water coming to it from the North Sea, it would have just been a freshwater lake. Next up, the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. They meet at the Strait of Gibraltar and have both a different density and salinity. So there's two reasons their waters don't mix. Then we have the Caribbean Sea and Atlantic Ocean. The place where they meet is near the Antilles, and it's very easy to spot. It looks like someone has painted water with two different shades of blue. Another place where these two meet is Eleuthera Island of the Bahamas. The Caribbean Sea water is turquoise, and the Atlantic Ocean water is dark blue. There is also the Suriname River and the Atlantic Ocean, which meet near Paramaribo in South America. How about the Uruguay River and its afflux? These two meet in Misiones province in Argentina. One of them is claimed to be used in agriculture, and the other has an almost red tint to it because of loam during rainy seasons. Here's an interesting one. The Rio Negro and the Solimoes Rivers, part of the Amazon River. Six miles from Manau in Brazil, the Rio Negro and Solimoe Rivers flow into each other, but don't mix for about 2.5 miles. The Rio Negro is dark and the Solimoes is light. They have different temperatures and speeds of flow. Then there's the Moselle and Rhine rivers, which meet in Koblenz, Germany. The water in the Rhine is lighter than that of the Moselle. Okay, 
How about three different bodies? Like the Ilz, Danube, and Inn rivers. The junction of these three rivers is in Passau, Germany. The Ilz is a small mountain river to the left, the Danube is in the middle, and the Inn is a light river to the right. The Inn is wider than the Danube here, but is still its afflux. Take a look at the Alaknanda and Bhagirati rivers, which meet in India. Alaknanda is dark, and Bhagirati is light. I really hope I got those right. The Irtysh and Ulba rivers flow into each other in Kazakhstan, near the city whose name is Ust Kamenogorsk. The Irtysh has clean water, and the Ulba's water is cloudy. Moving further east, the Jialing and Yangtze rivers meet in Chongqing, China. I really hope that's close at least. The Jialing is clean, and the Yangtze is brown. The Irtysh River actually has another intersection with the Om River. These two rivers flow into each other in Omsk, Russia. Here, the Irtysh is cloudy, and the Om is pure and transparent. Speaking of Russia, the Chuya and Katun rivers meet in the Altai Republic. The water of the Chuya has an unusual cloudy white color here, and looks dense and thick. The Katun, by contrast, is clean and turquoise. Flowing into each other, they form a single two-colored stream that does not mix for some time. On the other side of the globe, we have the Green and Colorado Rivers. The place of their junction is National Park Canyonlands in Utah, USA. The Colorado River is brown, and the green is, well, green. The corridors of these rivers go through rocks with different chemical makeup. That's why they have such a big contrast of colors. Last, but not least, we have the Rhone and Arve Rivers. They flow into each other in Geneva, Switzerland. The Rhone is a pure river that flows out from the lakes of Geneva, while the Arve is cloudy and gets its water from the glaciers of the Chamonix Valley. This is by no means an exhaustive list of all the strange clients on our beautiful planet, but as you can see, it happens a lot more often than you think. These are the kinds of environmental oddities that can really teach you about the way the natural world works, if you're curious enough, of course. Thanks for watching. Oh, and let me know how well I did with the pronunciations. Constructive feedback is always helpful. Oh, wow, there's a hole in the bottom of the ocean. It seems that the ocean has a leak, but it's not like a leak you would expect where water is flowing out. It's more like a spring since water is flowing in, not out. This unique leak is something we know as Pythia's Oasis. A grad student was the one who accidentally discovered it. He noticed bubbles that were rising to the surface. Normally, bubbles in the ocean tell us there might be some hydrothermal vents, which are hotspots for some pretty cool things. These vents are actually like hot springs on the seafloor, but instead of bubbling with warm water, they release a fluid that has been superheated in the crust of our planet. When seawater seeps into these cracks and travels deep into the crust, it comes into contact with the extremely hot mantle. This heats seawater to very high temperatures, and as it moves back up towards the surface, it carries dissolved gases and minerals. When the hot fluid shoots out of the vents, it mixes with the surrounding seawater and quickly cools down. Just a short distance away from the vent, the temperature can drop to a comfortable 68 degrees Fahrenheit or so, which is, as it seems, exactly what some creatures like. And there are some real weirdos living down there in the darkness, like ghostly fish, giant red-tipped tube worms, and a unique type of shrimp with eyes on their back. And some of them, like tube worms and bacteria, rely on the chemicals and minerals released by the vents to survive in harsh conditions. But in this case, the bubbling water didn't come from a hydrothermal vent. It was there because of a spring, and that's a bit more concerning. You see, the water in this reservoir needs to stay where it is. If too much of it seeps out, there could be some serious consequences, especially for the surrounding area. You can see this unusual leak along the Cascadia subduction zone, which is a massive fault line off the Pacific Northwest coast. It's a place where two pretty big plates that make up Earth's crust come together and slide along each other. The water from Pythia's oasis kinda acts as a lubricant between these plates. You can think of the fault zone as an air hockey table. When the fluid pressure is high, it's like you've turned the air on. That means the friction between the plates is reduced, which allows the plates to move. But if the fluid pressure is lower, the two plates can lock together. 
which then leads to the buildup of stress. Not that they'll feel bad. In the context of tectonic plates, stress is some pressure or force that can cause deformation. And if this stress starts to build up, at some point, it's got to go somewhere. When it's too much, it can trigger earthquakes and most likely not small ones. For example, a release of stress in the Cascadia subduction zone could lead to a magnitude 9 earthquake. For comparison, the biggest earthquake we've ever recorded happened in Chile in 1960, and it had a magnitude of 9.5. The damage was enormous. So we hope the water will stay in its reservoir and keep maintaining the delicate balance between the tectonic plates. We've explored only 5% of the ocean. Who knows how many cool things are there at the bottom, waiting to be found? For example, check out these mysterious holes scientists have stumbled upon in the depths of the Atlantic Ocean, near the Azores. They're neatly aligned and are about 4 inches apart, or in some cases, even several feet. They resemble punctures left by a sewing machine. Some think these holes could have a biological origin. For instance, some fish may have made them while walking along the seafloor. Others believe we could be looking at something that's human-made, maybe left by a spiked tire. Of course, such holes are perfect for making up stories about creatures from other planets who allegedly made them. Or maybe even legendary monsters, like that one from Loch Ness. It's definitely hard to explain such symmetry of the holes, but one deep-sea biologist offered a pretty good explanation. He said there could be an animal burrowing beneath the sediment, and from time to time, it could make little chimneys just to get access to clean water circulation in its small burrow. I mean, there are sediment piles around the opening of each hole, and they do support the idea that something pushed the soil from below. But there's still no proof these holes are actually connected beneath the surface. And there are also a lot of things hidden at the bottom of the oceans and seas that ancient civilizations left us. For instance, archaeologists made a really cool discovery off the southern coast of Croatia. A road hidden under layers of sea mud that's 7,000 years old. They found the ancient road at the sunken Neolithic site of Solin. The site of Solin was a human-made island in ancient times, and an archaeologist discovered it two years ago. He was studying satellite images of the area around Korčula, one of the beautiful Croatian islands. When he realized there could be something interesting at the bottom of the sea, he dove into the water with his colleague. And under the surface of the Adriatic Sea, which is part of the Mediterranean Sea, at a depth of 13 to 16 feet, they found stone walls that were most likely part of some ancient settlement. The landmass where people built the settlement was separated from the main island by a narrow stretch of land. Luckily, this area is protected from big waves by the surrounding islands, so the site remained relatively well preserved. It's now hidden beneath the surface of the sea and covered in mud. But it's so exciting to imagine how people walked on that road nearly 7,000 years ago, visiting nearby settlements. If you want to see the weirdest creatures, you can always head to the bottom of the sea. Actually, scientists have determined there could be more than 30 potentially new species at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. They've collected them using their remote-controlled vehicle. That's a big step, because until recently, they could only study such creatures through photographs. I'm talking about segmented worms, different types of coral, some invertebrates similar to centipedes, and many others. But there are also many old freaky creatures that we already know about that look like they came from sci-fi movies. Red octopus, blobfish, okay this one kind of looks normal until you raise it to the surface, the goblin shark, Sloan's viper fish, zombie worms, ugh, yeah I hear ya, let's move on. The seafloor hides things from space too. There are traces of rare forms of plutonium and iron at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. And what's awesome is that all this has come from space. These radioactive materials probably formed during some kind of cataclysmic event in space and eventually made their way out to our beautiful home planet. And this extraterrestrial debris most likely appeared on Earth within the past 10 million years. After it fell to the Pacific Ocean and settled at a depth of almost a mile, it became part of all those layers of rock down there. 
plutonium is especially exciting for scientists. I mean, only tiny amounts of it have been found. Hundreds of atoms, maybe. But it's still remarkable because these atoms are created by exploding stars. Things like this can help us better understand how the universe produces elements heavier than iron, like plutonium, gold, uranium, and platinum. We're still not sure about the origins of these elements. For a long time, scientists believed that supernovae, which is when a star comes to its end in a fabulous explosion, were responsible for creating these heavy elements. But it seems it's not just that. Some other cosmic events, such as the collision of neutron stars, which are super dense collapsed stars, or some rare types of supernovae, could also be involved. Whoa, let me get my popcorn! How would you describe the shape of the planet we live on? It's definitely round, but it's not a perfect sphere. Because of the force of Earth's rotation, it's slightly flat on the North and South Pole. But there's more to it. The planet's rotation causes its sides to bulge outwards. The best term to describe our home planet is ellipsoid. Earth is nothing more than an oversized lumpy potato. These are the words of Atraji Ghosh, a solid Earth geophysicist from Bangalore. She and her team have been studying something called the Indian Ocean Gravity Hole. Sounds like the scenario for a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. We think of gravity as something consistent. If you drop a pen from your hand in Los Angeles and in Perth, they're going to fall to the floor at the same time. Well, this is not completely true. Gravity is connected with the mass of a celestial body. Astronauts on the surface of our moon don't walk, but move in hops. That's because Earth weighs 81 times more than the moon. Less mass means less gravity. Earth is more massive, so it has a stronger gravitational pull. But there's a catch. All this mass isn't distributed evenly across the planet. As a result, gravity varies as well. NASA has been mapping Earth's gravity field since 2002 using twin GRACE satellites. The maps they produced show where gravity is stronger and where it's weaker. Mountain ranges such as the Himalayas contain a lot of mass. This means they generate a stronger gravity field. The opposite happens in ocean trenches. The deepest of them is the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. You could almost stack two Mount Kilimanjaros inside it. The low concentration of Earth's mass below it means that the gravity field here is weaker. Places on the globe where huge chunks of mass are missing are called geoid lows. A geoid is an imaginary surface that follows the outline of sea levels around our planet. Imagine the Earth without any land. That shouldn't be too hard since the nickname of our home is Blue Planet. Now draw a curvy line along the surface of the oceans, and you get a geoid. In reality, the line stretches across oceans, as well as land masses. Scientists use this imaginary line to calculate the depth of tremors or objects that occur underground. When the wavy line goes down, that's a geoid low. The biggest of them sits at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. The first to discover it was a Dutch geophysicist in 1948. He was performing a gravity survey from a ship. The man noticed that sea levels dipped over 320 feet below the global average. The gravity hole got the official name Indian Ocean Geoid Low. It spans well over a million square miles off the southern coast of India. If you went out at sea in the middle of the gravity hole, you wouldn't notice much, just an endless ocean as far as the eye could see. The only way to measure the dip in gravity is through extensive geophysical measurements and calculations. The concept of a gravitational hole existed for nearly two centuries in the scientific community, but researchers could study it in high detail only after satellite measurements became possible in the late 20th century. A team of Indian scientists was determined to explain the anomaly that had been puzzling geologists for decades. They used supercomputers to simulate the seismic activity that formed our planet. A total of 19 simulations revealed how tectonic plates moved across the span of over 140 million years. This was during the Cretaceous period, the time when T-Rex roamed the Earth. 
Nearly a third of the possible scenarios produced a geoid look, similar to the one in the Indian Ocean. The most important factor in these models was the presence of magma plumes. These are places inside the Earth's mantle where lava flows upwards. The mantle sits between the planet's outer core and the thin crust we walk upon. The magma in the mantle plume is hotter than the surrounding rocks. The heat it generates melts and thins the crust. This creates hotspots that are brimming with volcanic activity. Yellowstone National Park and the Hawaiian Islands sit atop such hotspots. The Indian team of scientists linked the presence of magma plumes to the formation of the geoid low. Their source was an ancient ocean that disappeared tens of millions of years ago. It was located where the Himalayan mountain range sits today. Evidence of this lie in the marine rocks researchers found on the world's tallest mountains. The oceans ceased to exist when India's landmass separated from the supercontinent called Gondwana. It drifted north and merged with the rest of the Asian continent. At the time, the Eurasian supercontinent was called Laurasia. The Indian tectonic plate went down inside the mantle. It ended up under the African continent. This landmass contained a lot of crystallized material, which was quite dense. When the sinking plate of the former ocean reached it, plumes of magma spilled out. As a result, low-density materials ended up closer to Earth's surface. Density is used to calculate mass, and if you remember our lesson in physics from the beginning of the video, less mass translates into a weaker gravity field. Scientists believe this is how the geoid low in the Indian Ocean formed some 20 million years ago. At this point in prehistory, the Earth looked a lot like it does today. There were vast grasslands, and whales swam in the seas. Geophysicists who created the computer model cannot tell for sure what will happen in the future. Ghosh thinks it's possible that the gravity hole in the Indian Ocean will remain in place for a long time. But plate movements can also cause the anomaly to fully disappear in the coming eons. Earth's tectonic plates are constantly shifting. They define the shape of our continents and oceans. Experts study plate movements to get a picture of how our world looked millions of years ago. However, telling Earth's geologic future is much more complex. The gravity hole in the Indian Ocean is the biggest, but it's not the only one in the world. Other areas with low gravity include the island of Cuba and the Bahamas. On the opposite side of the spectrum are the Philippines. Here, gravity is stronger than normal, but the poles are the places with the strongest pull to them. They are the closest to the center of the Earth. If you stand directly on the North or the South Pole, you are 3,950 miles from the planet's core. At sea level on the equator, this distance increases by more than 13 miles. Earth's gravitational field also has an effect on your weight. At the equator, you weigh 1% less than you do on the poles. The South Pole is maybe more suitable for this experiment because there is actually ground there. But gravity is the strongest at the North Pole in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. This is where scientists in 2013 recorded the highest gravitational acceleration on the planet. This is the rate a falling object speeds up in freefall. The acceleration depends on the strength of gravity. When a team of researchers from a university in Perth set out to map these gravity changes, they discovered something interesting. Gravitational acceleration was the highest at the surface of the Arctic Ocean. This is something they expect to find, but the location of the lowest acceleration point amazed them. It wasn't on the equator as they assumed. The spot lay more than 600 miles south of it at Mount Huascarú in Peru. Scientists believe that the mountain's height had an effect on the phenomenon. This peak in the Andes is the highest point in the South American country. Hypothetically speaking, if a human falls from a height of 330 feet here, they will reach the ground 16 milliseconds later than if they performed the same stunt in the Arctic. In 1945, five TBF Avenger aircraft took flight for a routine training exercise around the Bermuda Triangle. In the middle of the exercise, the planes were struck by intense rain and heavy winds, despite the clear weather forecast. The pilots became extremely disoriented and radioed the base to report that their navigational equipment had stopped working. 
The last thing the base heard was, when the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we'll all go down together, and then static. The five planes and their 14 crew members were never seen or heard from again. On his very first voyage to the New World in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed through the Bermuda Triangle. Columbus reported that one night, when he was on the deck of the ship, he noticed a giant light appear in the distance, unlike anything he had ever seen before. Columbus looked at his compass for direction, and it gave off erratic readings. You might have noticed that the Bermuda Triangle doesn't appear on any world map. This is because official institutions refuse to acknowledge that the area actually exists. A popular theory suggests that rogue waves are responsible for the many disappearances. Rogue waves are called extreme storm waves by scientists. They occur when different weather patterns take place at the same time and cause large unexpected waves. Witnesses say that the waves look like giant walls of water. These waves could explain why ships go down fast and without leaving any trace. The Bermuda Triangle is home to some pretty intense and unexpected weather. Storms build up quickly and unexpectedly, then disappear soon after. If you blink, you might miss it. This could explain why few distress signals are issued. Pilots and sailors never saw the weather coming. No one knows exactly how many ships and planes have disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. The rough estimate is 50 ships and 20 planes. Most of the time, the disappearances had no explanation and no wreckage has ever been left behind. Another bizarre theory trying to solve the Bermuda Triangle mystery comes from Charlie Berlitz. He insists that the area is home to the lost city of Atlantis. The missing ships and planes and malfunctioning equipment, according to him, were all caused by rays of energy let out by the special energy crystals that power Atlantis. While this sounds silly, Berlitz's theory was convincing enough that over 20 million people bought his book worldwide. In the year 1800, a large sailing vessel called the USS Pickering departed from the U.S. on its way to the West Indies. The ship sailed into the Bermuda Triangle along with its 90-man crew and was never heard from again. The USS Pickering was the first ever confirmed ship to vanish in the Bermuda Triangle. It's believed that the ship was taken out by a storm, but because no wreckage was ever found, we'll never know for sure. When the TBF Avenger planes went missing, a massive search operation was conducted. Boats and planes searched the Bermuda Triangle for any signs of the aircraft. One of the boats searching was a PBM-5 Mariner airboat. The airboat took flight at 7.27 p.m. and called in a routine radio message three minutes later. Then, it was never heard from again. No trace was ever found of the rescue airboat or the five Avenger aircraft. An enormous investigation was launched into the disappearance of all these vehicles, but nothing was ever discovered. This particular area of the ocean is one of the most heavily traveled shipping routes in the world. Some skeptics believe that this fact solves the mystery. Statistically, the busier the area, the higher the frequency of accidents and disappearances. While this makes sense, it's not the frequency of disappearances that's responsible for the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. It's the lack of explanation or wreckage found. On the ocean floor, decomposing organisms let off large concentrations of methane gas that gets trapped under the water. This gas can build up until, boom, it ruptures. The gas surges up to the surface and erupts. If a ship was in the area of one of these ruptures, the water would become much less dense and cause the ship to sink rapidly and without warning. Scientists believe this could be the cause of the many disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle. While this theory makes a lot of sense, it doesn't seem too likely. The U.S. Geological Survey has stated that no large releases of gas are believed to have occurred in this area for the past 15,000 years. The ocean floor is made of rocks containing a lot of magnetite. It's more like iron. Magnetic fields react to high concentrations of magnetite on the ocean floor, which may start a sort of conflict between the two. It can often lead to various weather anomalies and, as a result, navigation issues. And naturally, any changes in the ocean floor or the Earth's magnetic fields influence the Bermuda Triangle a lot. 
Since the magnetic field is constantly moving, it might be also taking the Bermuda Triangle with it. Now that people know where the triangle is, it's easy to avoid it. It supposedly moves eastward together with the magnetic poles. But scientists still can't answer where exactly it will be in a couple of years. Some people blame all the disasters on the extraterrestrial paranormal activity. Others suppose it's all about raging natural phenomena. There's another triangle in Lake Michigan. Just like the one near Bermuda, the Michigan Triangle got its shady reputation for some disappearances. The first recorded one dates back to 1679. A large vessel, one of the largest of that time, set out on an expedition. Yet, once it got in the sinister triangle, it never came back. Much later, an aircraft disappeared in this triangle. The skies are usually very clear there. But back in 1883, some people witnessed abnormal things in the area. Some claim to have seen large blocks of ice falling from the skies, and the crew even managed to save one as hard proof. Meanwhile, the Pacific Ocean mystery area is another sinister triangle. Off the south coast of Japan, not far away from Tokyo, there's a sea where plenty of ships met their doom, disappearing without a trace in these waters. They call it the Devil's Triangle. Some scientists believe the cause of anomalies is the environmental changes. Also, there's a really high concentration of methane hydrates on the bottom of the ocean in the Pacific Triangle area. You're deviating from your original course and sailing in the wrong direction. There's the Caribbean Sea near the triangle peppered with small islands. The seafloor here isn't deep. The ship can get in shallow waters. And now the ship is stuck on a shoal and you have no idea where you are. If this were the 21st century, the ship's captain would be able to reach the shore using GPS and other modern navigation. But the most interesting thing is that the compass would work correctly this time, since the magnetic north pole hasn't already coincided with the true one for a long time in the territory of the Bermuda Triangle. The Agonic Line is somewhere far away from here. There are no problems with navigation now. But for some reason, this is where ships disappear. In fact, not just here. Throughout the Atlantic Ocean, there are places where many more ships were gone. The Bermuda Triangle is not even in the top 10 of such places. One of the main reasons why many ships are lost here is that one of the most popular shipping routes in the Atlantic passes through the Bermuda Triangle. And the more ships in one place, the more shipwrecks. Simple probability. Then, it just starts getting weird. Other theories say that there's a space-time rift in this region. Ships and planes fall into this rift and end up in the past or the future. But for some reason, there's not a single proof of this myth. There's no reason to think that the rift is hidden somewhere here. The base of an extraterrestrial civilization is located in the Bermuda Triangle. Visitors from other galaxies steal sea vessels along with the crew, so no one finds the wreckage of the ships. This is also a popular myth that has no scientific justification. The Kraken lives somewhere in the Triangle. It's a huge squid that sinks ships and also is a legend that sailors tell each other. However, gigantic squids live in the depths of the ocean. They can grow to the size of a half a train car, but no cases have ever been recorded where they sunk a large vessel. And in the area of the Bermuda Triangle, they have never ever been seen. People in the past didn't know about the existence of these creatures. So when they saw them for the first time, they described them as huge, terrible monsters. Giant squids are some of the most elusive creatures on Earth, and scientists had to use sonar equipment to find them. They don't like to leave the dark depths and are likely to be afraid of the sound of any ship. So that should squash the squid as a suspect. <laughs>